Wir fahren Rennen, weil es erstens zur Tradition des Hauses gehört, schon von meinen Vaters Zeiten her, der ja selber sogar Rennen fuhr. Und zum Zweiten, weil ich der Meinung bin, dass wir in Rennen sehr viel Erfahrung sammeln können und dass die Ingenieure und ihre Leistungen durch den Rennsport angespannt werden, weil sie kurzfristige Ziele und Erfolge dabei haben. have been incredibly successful at Le Mans. That type of race has been designed for their cars. You know, I found out, I think in 2012, it was announced that Porsche were coming back to Le Mans. And uh, that's when I was starting endurance racing. And obviously it was immediately the goal, you know, would love to, to be spotted by, by Porsche. It does mean a lot for me to drive for Porsche at Le Mans, uh, especially if I think the last two Swiss uh, were Joe Sifford and Herbert Müller, two of the most famous Swiss racing drivers, and they drove for Porsche at Le Mans, and I'm now in their footsteps, and, I'm, and I hope I can fill them. Yeah, Le Mans is uh, definitely the, the, I mean the, the biggest race um, for, for a driver and for the brand and you know the history of Porsche at Le Mans is just uh, outstanding. It's one of the unique races that, that are left from the, from the old times obviously uh, and, and um, the combination of a closed racetrack and open uh, normal roads, country roads are not there anymore so Le Mans is really the last, last race uh, in history that's been like that and it's that's why you always already uh, when you walk into the paddock you understand it's a magical place. Well, to win in Le Mans even more I think when you're a French driver you know it's very very important for sure when you are an endurance driver it's a, it's a goal it's a target in your life. This is a Porsche 356. It's the car that got Porsche off the ground as a road car manufacturer and also got it into motorsport. It's the car that gave Porsche its first taste of the Le Mans 24 hours, the greatest endurance race on earth. Yeah, Porsche and Le Mans this has a long history together. Porsche and Le Mans belong together. And everything started at the uh, car saloon in Paris in 1950 when Ferdinand Porsche was approached by Charles Ferrou, the organizer of the Le Mans race and the race director. And Ferdinand Porsche and Ferrou they knew each other quite well from pre-war times because both of them were in racing scenes and Mr. Ferrou was also a famous uh, motor journalist. And so somehow he convinced Ferdinand Porsche to bring some cars to the Le Mans race for 1951 and uh, this was also a kind of political affair because just a few years after the end of World War II a German manufacturer participated on the most famous and most traditional car race in France. The boys from Porsche agreed for two reasons. The first being that they saw what privateers had done with the 356. They knew how it could perform and that they'd be in with a decent shout. The second, they had absolutely no PR budget. Ferry Porsche, he disliked advertisements. He thought it's a waste of money. He wanted to invest all the money into the cars to make them better. Motorsports was also fantastic marketing for, for the cars because the cars could prove their, yeah, their, 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 their performance directly in front of the future customers. When it came to choosing a car to run, the 356 was obviously Porsche's choice, sort of. This Car starting in Le Mans was a big surprise for everyone because the uh, 356 was basically an unknown uh, car. So the first prototype came out in 1948 and uh, for the 356 they sent to Le Mans was a special car. It was an SL 
SL means super legero, super light. So even one year before Mercedes has adopted this name for the 300 SL, it was used by Porsche. And uh, the car had an aluminum body made in Gmünd in Austria. Everything was handmade and it was aerodynamically modified. They were lighter, narrower and slipperier than the standard road car. Of the three cars the company entered into the race, only one crossed the finish line, but it came first in its class. And you have to remember that Porsche were there for the first time, tangling with teams that had been at it for years, and they won. Le Mans 1951, this was the first official race attempt from Porsche, it was the first factory team. Porsche sent, sent to a race and uh, for Porsche as a brand this was an international breakthrough. With a winning car under its belt Porsche knew it had to keep going. In 1952 three more SLs were entered but it became clear that it had its limitations. Porsche needed a new car so looked towards privateers for answers. Walter Glocker had modified a 356 so that it was mid-engined. Not only that but it was rather good with it. So the men from Stuttgart once again Go working. A big milestone for the Porsche motorsport uh, his, uh, history was the 550 Spider. It was the first true race car made by Porsche. It was designed and engineered on, only for racing. So it was a mid-engine race car with a tubular frame and an extra light uh, aluminum body. So this car was below 550 kilograms and it had a very special uh, engine inside. It was a for a race engine with four camshafts. We call it the Fuhrmann engine because it was uh, designed by Dr. Ernst Fuhrmann. It participated in Le Mans 1953 and uh, yeah, for the next decade it became one of the dominating race cars in, the, in these uh, capacity classes. Over the next few years Porsche would update the 550 giving it more power and less roof. Its skills not only helped it shine at Le Mans but all over the world. 1958 would be the last time Porsche's cars would make a big splash at Le Mans until the 60s. A shiny new 718 RSK took third place overall. That's less than 10 years after Porsche entered Le Mans in the first place. As the swinging 60s began, Porsche got off to a flyer. The 718, refreshed in 1960, then again in 61, was a 160 mile an hour, 160 brake horsepower monster, and it won its class in 61 and took fifth overall. The 904 GTS was introduced in 1964 and it was designed by Bootsy Porsche's own fair hand. It's the first of the so-called plastic Porsches, so nicknamed because of its glass fibre construction, but its pressed steel chassis was nice and strong. It was also fairly smart, it was designed to take different engines depending on what Porsche wanted it to do. I think the, for me the 1960s were really the, the climax of Porsche motorsports. They were so creative, they built so many new race cars. Ferdinand P, he wanted to get the overall victories and uh, yeah, without him today the, the Porsche Museum would be half empty. Pieck was so keen to win, he managed to irritate the man at the top, Ferry Porsche. There were always some internal fights uh, for, for, for money. Uh, and uh, yeah, Mr. P, he, he spent a lot of money into, uh, into testing and uh, into the engineering of, of new race cars. And uh, there we know that Ferry Porsche was not happy at all with it. The 908 almost delivered the goods in 1968 and again in 69, but it was that year that braking issues meant it had to slow down on the last lap, lest they gave out completely. Jackie X overtook in a GT40, claiming Ford's last Le Mans victory by a mere 75 yards. Yeah, 69 was a very special year in the Le Mans and Porsche history. It was the closest final ever. So at the end of the race, there was a extremely hard fight between uh, Hans Hermann in his 908 long tail and uh, Jackie X in his Ford uh, GT40 and uh, yeah, they were over overtaking each other every lap. Uh, I've spoken with both race drivers about this and uh, on the long straight runs when they were driving next to each other they were looking into, the, into their eyes so it was really a close fight and uh, yeah at the end before the last corner Jackie X uh, overtook Hans Hermann and uh, yeah he has won the race by something about 80 meters so it was the closest final ever. Pieck was inspired to make a new car, a leaner, faster car, one that he knew would win Le Mans. 
Ferry Porsche, however, wasn't quite so convinced. Race car development was expensive and they couldn't really afford it. So to get his way, Piek personally guaranteed the development costs of his new race car. Porsche agreed and Piek was allowed to make one more, the 917. I started on the, on the 917 because this was the project to win Le Mans. And uh, well, of course, I started with detail work, fuel uh, supply to the engine or uh, gearbox cooling or things which, which were nobody there to do it because uh, Porsche was a very, very small race department. And everybody is doing, let's say, one or two jobs parallel. <laughs> The 917 long tail was quick but not so stable and it should be a little quicker and more stable. The drag should be improved because they had quite some downforce at least but the drag should be improved with the same downforce. All these things which even today <laughs> it's always the same question but it depends on the, on the situation and in, in 1970 the tools were not so good as we have it today. Porsche was experimenting with new materials and with many new ideas like the adaptive aerodynamic. So even the 908 long tails, they had these, these adjustable flaps which were connected to the, to the wheel suspension and uh, yeah, it helped the, the car to, to drive through the corners even faster. And uh, it was homologated but uh, later on became an issue and uh, yeah, it, was, it got forbidden. Though none of Porsche's factory cars made it all the way, one from Porsche Salzburg did. Driven by Richard Atwood and Hans Hermann, the 917 came over the line in first place. Porsche had done it. The following year, a 917 driven by Helmut Marko and Heiss van Lennep wearing martini colours crossed the line a full two laps ahead of everyone else. It covered 3,315 miles, an average speed of over 138 miles an hour, a record that was unbeaten until 2010. Peek didn't need to worry about his development money anymore. After that, the ACO, Le Mans governing body, put a 3-litre engine size limit on competitors, effectively killing the 917. Porsche stayed away until 1973 to give Norbert Singer and his team time to turn the 911 into a proper race car. They'd be back again in 1974, this time mid turbo. Looking to the 917 for inspiration, which could muster over 1,200 horsepower with a blower, Singer used a 2.1-litre turbo in a Carrera RSR, and that would allow it to enter the Sport 3000 class. It came second overall. We had the Carrera Turbo, the first Turbo at Le Mans, which were actually we were second. Well, nobody cares about second, but for us it was important to be second overall behind the Matra. The next year, Porsche stayed away from Le Mans because they were preparing the 911 Turbo for production. The second half of the 70s, there were some, some new racing rules uh, and Porsche was looking for the sports car championship and uh, for the uh, brand championship. And uh, for that reason, Porsche designed the 935 and the 936, which was an open spider with a turbocharged engine. Together, Porsche was the dominating brand and in these years. In the first year, 1976, we were able to win both world championships, which was a huge, huge success. We had a turbo engine and we could improve aerodynamics a little more. We got a wider wing, we got wider tires, we got we did everything uh, to improve it. So the next step to the 935, so when we got the regulation, well, okay, we used all the possibilities and regulations, so we could change the fenders, which was actually not planned by the FIA in these days, but the regulation says the fenders are free. So, and the Porsche had quite big fenders, so you had a quite free space to modify. Porsche designed the 935 and the 936, which was an open spider with a turbocharged engine. Yeah, the 935, uh, for many, many years, it became the dominating race car in the GT classes and uh, not only the factory, also many privateers have used the 935 and uh, yeah, in 1979 a 935 K3 from Crema from was able to make an overall victory and this was a sensation, a s GT car, a sports car, a 911 was an overall winner in Le Mans against the prototypes, what a sensation. 1980 began interestingly. Professor Furman, the company's CEO and the man who designed the engine that went in the 550, managed to piss off Ferry Porsche and 
everybody because he decreed that the 911 would shortly be discontinued so the company could concentrate on front-engined rear-wheel drive cars. The 911 is at the heart of everything that Porsche stood for uh, since the 356 was replaced. Um, and that's how people felt about it. There were also people in the racing team who felt that they'd only joined the company to go for outright wins. As such, at that year's Le Mans, the company would enter three 924s, one driven by an American team, one by Germans, and one by the British. So that 924 Carrera GT prototype was, I remember it as really one of, one of the best handling cars uh, I've ever raced. Uh, Obviously, it's so far removed from a standard 924 that there's no real comparison. Uh, it had a one-piece front-end bit of bodywork, an incredibly stiff chassis for, for that sort of car. It was very impressive. And I think that's one of the reasons for its excellent handling. And you could just feel like you could do anything with that thing. It was brilliant from that point of view. 1981, Porsche also got a new CEO. Mr. Peter W. Schutz, uh, a German-American manager, and he asks the guys at the racing department, uh, how about the, the 924? Can it be an overall winner? And they said, not at all, only class victory. That is, then I'm not interested in, in Le Mans. I want to get an overall victory. Who is this guy? You know, American bloke, only been in, in diesel engines and trucks. What's he know? He's not a car guy, let alone a sports car guy. And he's brilliant. He, he just came in and did really all the right things straight away. First thing he said is that you're not going to drop the 911. When we had a, a big meeting, he said, uh, do we have any chance to win overall with the 944? And we said, no, no, we run for a class win. Why we don't uh, prepare something to win, have a chance winning overall? So I said, well, actually we have nothing, but in the past, we, we got, it was in 79, we got the old 936 out of the museum, we can do it again. And then I had the idea to get the Porsche 936 Spider, which did win in 76 and 77, out of the Porsche Museum. They installed a new engine, which was uh, designed for the Indy series in the US, and they combined everything, did some little aerodynamical modifications, and then they brought this car to, to Le Mans in 81. Yeah, and big surprise, this car became overall winner. The same year, Porsche also entered a 924 GT prototype, a thinly veiled 944, driven by one Walter Roll. I drove in 1981 in a 944 prototype in Le Mans. It was just before the car was launched to, to the normal people, and it was a really successful uh, start because we finished seventh overall between all these sport cars. We get a special prize for the shortest time in the pit lane from all cars and we are just 24 hours, two drivers only, just driving, petroling, tires, go. And it was, was really impressive to, to finish in between all these supercars. I remember I, I, I finished, I went out of the car, pulled out my overall, was sitting in my car and was going home for 1,400 kilometers. And two minutes after the finish line. I said, I want to go home. <laughs> that was something very special. That was for, 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 for our engineers and our mechanics said, unbelievable. Now he's sitting in his car and goes home 1,400 kilometers. In 1982, Group C racing began. Cars had to weigh at least 800 kilos, have closed cockpits and meet a plethora of restrictions. Porsche's answer to this was the 956. The car was so good that it took first, second and third places. We made a big step forward because we left all these traditional things we had at, at, at Porsche with a space frame, for instance. We were not sure if the car is reliable. The engine, we know, it's not, it should be not a problem, but the rest, and at Le Mans, you know, you always have a lot of gearbox problems. And at the end, we got one, two, three. 
a new variant of the 956, the 956B, entered in 1984. It was lighter, had new front springs and a new engine management system and, unsurprisingly, it took the top spot and seven more top ten places. In order to comply with new regulations elsewhere in the world, Porsche developed a new take on the 956, the 962. The car was essentially a modified 956, though that does sell it somewhat short. Like its slightly older predecessor, it was not only incredibly popular, but also very successful for Porsche at Le Mans and elsewhere. Not only in the hands of the factory, though, but also privateers. The 962 was so good that it saw service all the way from its debut in 1984 and remain competitive until the mid-90s. 85 saw Porsche kick ass again, even though the race itself was apparently more of an economy run than a competition. In 1986, something interesting appeared. Alongside the now usual raft of 956s and 962s, something odd appeared a 961. In other words, the 959 was going endurance racing. The biggest advantage of this car was its all-wheel drive. But unfortunately it didn't rain so it had no big advantage uh, uh, of this and uh, yeah, became on, only uh, a class winner in, a, in the IMSA GTX series. Uh, next year in 87, yeah, one, of, one of the cars burned out. So there were some, some technical problems. But uh, yeah, the 1980s were dominated by the Porsche 956s, uh, which became another uh, iconic cast for Porsche. In 1988, after years of dominance, Porsche's streak was broken by a Jaguar XJR9. To put it simply, its 7.0-litre, 7 750 brake horsepower V12 was too much for the 962. In the early 90s, aside from entering a new 911 racer, Porsche largely stayed out of the limelight, though privateers did keep running 962s with a number of smart modifications to keep them competitive. One, Jochen Dauer, in 1994, even converted a 962 to road spec to get a race version qualifying in the GT class. Because of a series of competitor breakdowns, the Dauer 962 LM Porsches took first and third place overall in the 94 Le Mans, not something they expected at all. Dauer was reportedly told that his car was within the letter of the law, but not in the spirit of the race. It would not be permitted to enter again. Porsche returned, after a fashion, with the TWR Porsche WSC 95. It was a Franken car run by Joe Est that used a Jag chassis and a Porsche engine, merging two greats into one awesome car. 1996 saw Norbert Singer return the Porsche factory to Le Mans with this, the 911 GT1. We start with a, with a chassis from the 911, steel. Okay, it was modified after uh, the driver's seat and we, we turned the engine around to get a mid-engine car. And uh, it was continued in the next three years till we got a, a carbon chassis. And we get a, a complete new aerodynamics for that. So at least we had just the headlights from the 911. <laughs> which, which have a little bit uh, uh, a look like a 911. It shared a few bits with the 911, but not so much you'd notice, and it was powered by a twin-turbo flat-six 600-horsepower engine. In its debut year, the GT1 came second and third. Close, but not close enough. 1997 saw the GT1 return mildly tweaked as the Evo, but sadly, due to reliability issues, neither factory car crossed the finish line. Everything what you do, even if you do other races with that car, had to be reliable for Le Mans. Everything, every part, every piece you take, can it do 24 hours at Le Mans? For the race in 1998, the GT1 was upgraded again. This time it had full carbon fiber construction, different aero and a modified engine. Seeing as this race fell on the same year as Porsche's 50th birthday, only a win would do. Yeah, with the Porsche 911 GT1, another new era in Porsche Motorsports started because um, this car was something completely new. It was a 911, but with a mid-engine, not a rear engine. And uh, it, this car later on also was the first Porsche race car with a carbon fiber monocoque. So it was the first really modern race car. So it's not very far away from what we, we do, do today. And uh, yeah, with this car in 1998, Porsche was able to, to make the 16th overall victory. And 98 was a very special year for Porsche because we celebrated our 50th brand anniversary. It was a very, very nice race. But 
you, you don't go into the race, which was my personal uh, thinking, not planning to win. Of course, you're hoping, but you plan for, let's say, 12 hours and another six hours, and then we will see and we saw. After that, Porsche stuck to selling race cars that looked like race cars, 911 GT3 RSs and RSRs and all that kind of thing, but they took a well-earned break. After all, Porsche holds the record for the most overall Le Mans wins and over the decades has captured the hearts and minds of countless race fans. Now though, the company is returning to top flight LMP1 racing with this, the 919. Currently, Audi and Toyota rule the roost, so will they get another win? Let's hope so.